as you can see, this one's really not done. Okay, um, hello everybody. I'm uh, Evan Botcher. Um, I'm from uh, Melbourne in Australia. Um, I'll give you a little intro to me. Um, I'm just going to, if someone, my voice, I will tend to, uh, it, I have trouble projecting right across the room. So if anyone can't hear me at the back, just give me a little wave. I'll, I'll try and speak up. The, um, a little intro to who I am. I'm uh, from Melbourne in Australia. I work for ThoughtWorks, um, obviously branding on the slides. Um, I'm a software developer. Um, I'm not a sysadmin, although uh, for the last four or five years I've spent more time with my hands in production and scripting deployments and, and those sort of things, working closely with sysadmins and experienced engineers. Um, uh, mostly I consult uh, now to, to big organisations in Australia that, that are trying to uh, improve their, their time to market, their agility um, their, and, and the way that their teams are structured to make sure they get a better, a better time to market. Um, I like to, uh, to, to hike, it's my family, I don't know why I put that in there. Um, I won't give the intro to ThoughtWorks, um, I think you've probably got a fair idea uh, of where we're at, what sort of things we do. Um, but I'm going to give you a little sort of personal journey back in time. Um, this is me in 2001, I look a little bit different. I have the same wife, she doesn't look that different. I don't know how she does it, it's magic. Um, it's crazy, but 2001 I started um, learning about agile software development and um, what we called Agile then. These are the sort of things I was reading, extreme programming, and I was really fascinated by the technical practices, test-driven development, unit testing, and continuous integration, um, all the things that at a, tech, at a, at a team level um, made it possible to, to build better quality software. It wasn't until I joined ThoughtWorks in around 2006 that I learned how teams, uh, the, the rest of the Agile practices, the collective code ownership and emergent design and, and um, yeah, deferring planning and detailed analysis until the time we need it and how that would help us respond more quickly to customers' needs and, and learn from our software as we're building it. And so that was really great. But back then, um, sort of in, in that time, we were really smuggling agile into organisations. The dominant theme in, in big organisations was the traditional program delivery, waterfall, if you like, um, but, but big multi-year, huge funded projects that stripped the company of all the great people and, and, and delivered uh, program outcomes. And we'd go in and we'd hide in a, in a meeting room and, and run a little agile team. And it felt really good. We'd, we'd build a team that had all the skills and, and um, capability in it to deliver on a really good product with a close relationship with the business. And that's, that, was, that was what we called agile then. And big organisations tried to replicate that at scale, a big, a big organisation. And it kind of feels a, a bit like uh, Conway's Game of Life. This is a, if anyone's not familiar, it's an algorithmic simulation of, of um, with a simple um, life. Uh, game of life. Uh, yeah, Game of Life, yes. Um, and, and so this is what it felt like, a big burst of activity in, in an organisation and then just little petering bits of... Um, of activity and, and, and uh, agile teams that would eventually get swallowed up by the large organisations. So it's kind of fascinating to watch. I've I become quite mesmerised by it. Um, and so it's a bit of a puzzle how you make that kind of big change last in a big organisation. This is, um, and this is what it feels like sometimes to be in those big organisations if you're in the team that's building a customer experience, you're, you're interacting with the customer, you're building a, a, a mobile application. Um, a really common scenario is we have these teams that are, that are that, that kind of a, 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 what we consider to be a, a good agile team that have a direct um, channel to the customer and they're building a, an application, they can do it in really quick cycles because they, they're, really, um, they're, they're building a, an, an application, learning from the customer, doing testing with the customer, iterating on the product and then delivering it again. And that's great, but as soon as they come to touch any part of the organisation that's any deeper into the core, like core billing or finance systems or product and pricing, um, change in ESB, or even um, build some new infrastructure, they have to deal with the, the, the core of, core of the organisation that hasn't really adopted um, uh, agility. Uh, that's really common. Working with a, um, a telecommunications company in, in Australia, we, um, uh, no, sorry, a, a large public company, um, 
in Australia, we found that they had built a, a world-class digital delivery capability that could deliver small changes to mobile apps or websites very quickly, but if they actually wanted to innovate in the product space, they had to deal with a deeply entrenched, siloed, central core organisation. Very, very slow. Um, so so that's, um, that's difficult. One of the attributes we like about those teams is that they have all the skills in them um, that can... Um, can make changes across the full stack, including the infrastructure. If it's a, if it's a fully DevOps team, they've got people who can administer and run the systems that they, they're deploying. But in a large, kind of complex organisation, um, you end up with um, that the number of skills required to touch those core systems becomes very, very um, difficult. Um, who's heard of the Amazon two pizza team? It's a familiar concept. Amazon described their product teams. Um, as you can only have the team, so the upper bound of the team size is the number of people that you can feed with two pizzas. And that, that's about creating teams that communicate and work together effectively. Um, but if you had to have a, a, a team that represented your core um, uh, billing system, product management, pricing, if it's insurance or something, it's underwriting, all these, all, the, all of these core systems, you would need a team that would probably eat about 40 pizzas. So it's no longer going to be a, a sort of agile team shape. Um, so, so it's sort of, you know, a lot of people have come to the idea that agile doesn't scale. Um, but um, in 10 years at ThoughtWorks, so I meant to say I've been around for a little while, um, I've seen some, some really great examples of organisations at reasonable scale that have managed um, to, um, to take a different approach. They, don't, they don't, um, aren't as constrained by that, that need to have all, all the teams together. And I think two, there's two elements that have made a really, a really significant difference, and I want to talk a little bit about those. Um, the first, in terms of the org structure, is that the teams that are de delivering digital applications, they're actually the business. And so in some organisations, we, we no longer see this divide between the, the business and IT, and that really starts often around the pro in the product space, the channels, the touch points with a customer. So digital delivery becomes a part of our business. And a recent organisation, uh, financial services organisation, they actually took their entire, the teams that were considered to be the digital teams, and they actually handed them to, to the business and said, you work, you, know, you work integrated in the business, delivering product ideas um, in, in small increments out into the market and testing with the market. Um, so that's, that's one thing um, where IT and, and the business no longer have a divide. And the second thing that, that's become, uh, uh, has been really successful is to take those shared capabilities, the things that an organisation is built on top of, um, uh, and um, make them into internal platforms. I'll give you a little bit more about what I mean by those platforms and how it relates to, to DevOps as well. Um, um, and the playbook, the things, common elements that I've seen among successful organisations in this space uh, are really these three attributes. Um, the first is that um, teams stop using projects the concept of a project to deliver change. Obviously, that sounds sounds stupid. You still need something to, you know, some method or some initiative to, to drive um, change. But um, projects in the traditional sense, with a PMO and project managers and project teams, uh, are quite damaging to organisations. And so. Um, that, that accepted kind of best practice of having a, a project and recruiting te you know, team members to create, to create a project team that then delivers to a timeline and kind of runs out of time at the end, ships something into production and hands over to support teams. That, that idea is, um, is starting to go, um, is starting to lose favour. And, and, um, and so projects uh, as, a, as the primary method of delivery is, is, um, is going away. And I mean, projects, if you think, if we talk about DevOps and, um, as being that creating teams that have a, a responsibility for delivering and also running what they've delivered, so build, you build it, you run it, projects tend to deliver the anti-DevOps. Um, so um, the antidote is to create teams that, that stay together and stay uh, working with a set of applications for a longer period of time. That requires you not to have projects. 
in the traditional sense. The next part is to establish those internal platforms that I started to talk about. And I'll try and illustrate that with some really crude drawings off a whiteboard. I'm sorry, I had the scrawlings of a, of a ten-year-old. Um, but I thought, this is what I, how I was describing it to a, um, a customer on the whiteboard. I just took some snapshots of it and I thought maybe that would help. We start with the customer. The customer's here on the left. That actually says customers in my handwriting. <laughs> God. Um, customers interact with digital products. Mobile application, um, web, website, mobile site. Um, kiosk application, whatever, the, whatever that kind of digital product is. And so architecturally, you're interacting with digital products. And those digital products and the organisations that, that um, have adopted this approach are then built on top of a platform, a business platform, which is those shared capabilities. And, and so I've got you know, some examples, finance and payments, uh, product and pricing um, was very big in an organisation I was just working with, customer. Um, CRM and customer and the onboarding of customers and registration and identity, their business capabilities that um, your organisation has and they're a platform. We'll come back to talk about the APIs. And then you have um, foundational capabilities. I'm just calling them foundational capabilities to keep them separate. And that is um, things like having a, a platform to deploy your applications on. So these platforms are deployed on an application hosting platform. You might have data as a, as a service, as a platform that you can um, perform, uh, pour, pour data into and then access that data for analytics. Um, you might have delivery tooling like continuous delivery tools and continuous integration tools, um, source control. These are foundational capabilities that everything else is built on. And at this point, you kind of say, okay, this is just a, a model of your organization. This is just enterprise architecture, but the, the difference when I say um, that there are uh, uh, these things are, are platforms that are, are like an internal product, and and this um, you know, a couple of organisations I've worked with have, have said pretty much these the teams that are associated with this platform are like an internal vendor, like a software as a service vendor for for this capability, and and their their responsibility is to deliver that capability via an API. So that, so that these digital teams can move as fast as they want, building new product on top of those. So, it's a, so it's a, it, di it is a subtly different um, philosophy and focus. And then when we get down into the infrastructure side, I'll we'll come back and talk to, talk to how, that's, um, how that's been impacted. And the, the thing that, um, the sort of dirty truth or the ugly truth is that most organisations have these shared capabilities, but they're complete boat anchors. They're just slowing the organisation down because they don't provide a very compelling or, or productive um, experience. The, the, the team's trying to build product on, on top of your hosting platform or your, or your core product and pricing uh, platform. Um, right now, uh, it, it's a very slow experience. You have to um, uh, create project structures that allow for change in the digital product and then so, you know, wait weeks and weeks for changes to be made in the core product system and, and then uh, for hosting to happen in weeks and weeks. So they, they're, not, they're not designed for a quality of service. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So compelling. Um, I've done this exercise before with, with um, uh, teams where I get a, a blank grey box and, I, and some marker pens and, and paper and get people to draw what's compelling about their offering internally. They're thinking about internal customers who are going to use their system um, and why they should use that system. We're working with a, uh, a document management platform within um, an insurance company and that, that document management um, platform in order to make a change to a, to a product you needed to change the document templates that would be sent to customers and you needed to engage a project manager and then that work to change document template might take weeks to be scheduled into a queue to make a very small change to a template and you, like 10 weeks later you've got your product change ready to go to, go to market. That's not a compelling experience. It's not helping us get, get our product to market quicker. So, so it has to change to be more self-service for the, for, the, um, for the business and for the product teams. And then the bit about team, like the, the soft skills, the, the bit that affects people is um, that we want to create stable teams. 
um, that operate the platforms and take and, and take responsibility for the plat for those platforms. So, um, for each of these um, products, we'd have a, a product team that might be building uh, a mo uh, in a banking situation, building a mobile application to allow for loan origination. Uh, we might have a, the platform team will will have a team. That, that runs the finance and payments capability, and they live with that for a long period of time, you know, you know, maybe months, maybe years, and they take responsibility, full responsibility for every feature that's on there, and they take the operational responsibility in that DevOps way, where they're on the pager and on the pager rotation for that. So, organising in this way has helped these organisations say, okay, yeah, we, we're going to create a, a boundary within which we'll do we'll do the DevOps um, shared responsibility. So one of the things that's, that's important there is we have a product owner. And this is one of the challenges that, that organisations have is when you've got an internal platform, who is, you know, what is the product, who is the product owner, and how do they meet all of the, the requirements that are being placed on them? Well, the product owner on these platform teams, they own the roadmap of features that are going to be available on this platform. And they, um, if that... Uh, that feature roadmap doesn't meet the requirements of the digital products that are being built on it that other people have to negotiate for, for the priority. Um, but that product owner needs to be strong and say, I'm building a, I'm building a, a, a Salesforce-like experience, not, a, not just uh, saying yes to every requirement that comes in. And the delivery team for a platform needs to have all the skills in it required to, to, um, to deliver, including... Um, being able to operate and troubleshoot and triage uh, problems, um, uh, test the software, showcase it, design interfaces, everything they need. So, so we're talking about a, a properly cross-functional delivery team. And what happens when you when you build a team that's that's running like that is, and, and in the organisations that I've seen that are successful, they increase the level of autonomy um, that those teams have. So the those teams are, are encouraged to make their own technical decisions um, without having to go through some central design authority and, and governance um, that in order to run that platform. An increased level of ownership of, that, of the outcome also comes with an ability to make your own decisions that might affect, uh, that, that'll affect the application stability. And um, just this is uh, my go-to playbook for how we've done that at scale at, at numerous organisations is the, the work that Spotify published around the, the tribes and guilds, chapters, um, organisational structure, and we've, we've built platforms that are a, a, a tribe. If you haven't read the Spotify material on how they structure their teams, um, including the, there's some quite good videos that describe how that works, um, I highly recommend it. Um, it's a way of balancing the, the uh, independence of a team to make its own decisions with communities of practice that allow teams to share um, uh, what, what's working, what's not, what the best um, outcomes are for the company. So I want to whiz through, I, um, I don't want to take all night, but I want to talk about some of the changes that happen when you, when you adopt a structure like this. Um, I, um, I talk about architecture. Um, a lot of these organisations that I, I go to have a start with a centralised enterprise architecture team with solution architects and technical architects and infrastructure architects and all, all projects must go with a, a solution design and it has to be um, signed off by those teams and um, that, that just gets tipped completely on its head in a, in a structure of platforms. So um, Clearly, we just disband the architecture team and we push people, um, the technical leaders, out into the <coughs> platform teams to help the, the delivery teams make decisions. Job done. Or maybe I'll come back to that. Um, program management. I said that we're not doing projects anymore, projects and, and multi-year programs. Um, well, it's not quite true. We still have, um, have to have an understanding of what work is being done and where spend is and what benefits are happening. But... Um, these organisations, it's not my area of specialty, but they shrink their, their overall PMO and they, um, they attack a more um, smaller delivery um, tranches, smaller bits of work that are fed into, into the platform teams to deliver. This is blurred out, but this is six months' worth of um, planned work for an um, a, a Australian Stock Exchange top 20 company. Um, 
uh, in, the, in the financial services area. And each of these pieces of work is a, is a, starts with a hypothesis. This is a benefit that we think we'll get. A set of experiments that will, um, that will determine whether it should be funded. And then when it moves into funding beyond this wall, it's only ever funded for short periods of time. So you're constantly getting uh, uh, opportunities to measure the, the, whether the, the delivery is working. Um, which, which works quite well. There's a lot more on ThoughtWorks.com and Insights channel for, for lean, lean governance. Um, integration and data, um, that changes. I said that the API um, is the, um, essentially the front door, the, the product that, these, uh, that a platform is providing. And so um, making that a compelling API um, becomes the, the, um, the measure of success. And so um, you know, high quality APIs that are discoverable and accessible, that, um, that are robust, they, they survive through change and they're easy to integrate with, that becomes the, the measure by which you, um, your teams um, should work. And um, there's also a big impact on data um, we've managed in a, in a number of organisations to shift away from the traditional um, ETL-based data warehousing um, and make the platforms responsible for high-quality data. Um, infrastructure and operations, that might be, might be of interest to this group. Um, obviously, um, I'll tell a little story about a, a financial services organisation I was working with in, in Australia. We, um, we went to them and I one of the first things I did in consulting with them was to go and, and uh, ask them how they make a change to their production uh, infrastructure. And um, I was, kind of went through a few scenarios, and depending on the type of change, there, there were, you may have to involve the um, automation team, um, the, the middleware team who own the application server configurations, um, the mid-range team who own the operating system un underlying that, the um, uh, the virtualization platform owned by the Wintel team, then if you need to change storage, you need the storage team, the network, you need networks, both of which were outsourced. Um, the, the separate change management and release management teams, um, and the enterprise monitoring team if you need to change a significant part of your service. Um, there's, and there's actually a few more security, obviously, and, um, and uh, internal risk. And each of those teams were might even sit in the same building, but they did not communicate. They were separate, siloed parts of our organisation that hated each other. I've met teams that have a DevOps problem, but I've never actually met one that has a DevOps, ops, 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 ops problem quite that, quite that bad. Um, every one of those teams was um, acting, um, like they weren't acting evil, they were acting perfectly sane within the constraints that they had. They were optimising for... Um, what they what they had to deliver and what they needed to protect, but nobody was measuring how long it took to to stand up a new service, and so um, we you know once it came to light how long and it was in, in the months it would take to deploy a new service that was with the right support that was declared not good enough, and so we started to build a new um, uh, infrastructure platform um, infrastructure on demand that um, would would exhibit a, what we consider would be a good platform for deploying on top of. And the, some of the key elements of that were that the, the teams that are building products or platform uh, business level platforms must be able to access these things through a self-service API. And, and not just that they could access the thing through an API and then have no control over it, they must then be able to provision and, and configure um, the, the service complete, uh, the complete stack. And no, no tickets. And I put an aster on there because there were still things that like, you might need to do once every six months, six or 12 months. You could, you could live with that. But, but essentially get, getting rid of the idea of dealing with the infrastructure teams via tickets and completely um, self-service. Um, and I don't need to tell you guys that that really drove uh, a shift. Um, as soon as the first team, this, is a, this was in a financial services organisation, highly regulated, but the first team who, who gained um, access to um, AWS drove up the demand on the internal organisation to the point where they needed to, to react. Um, so um, these are the sort of technologies, if I'm talking to, to stakeholders, that they need to be looking at. Um, uh, not, uh, it's obviously more than Cloud Foundry, but, but um, PaaS and IaaS um, services, both public public cloud and, and potentially private cloud. Um, and 
make those those services available directly to the teams that that need to deliver on um, software on top of them, not provide create some layer that takes a ticket and then uses the AWS you know, console to spin something up manually, but actually um, provide a, a compelling service by by brokering access directly to the cloud platforms. But it's um, we found it's not enough that the teams, delivery teams, this you know in a, in a large organisation will by by human nature still want a team to do things for them because there's a, a learning curve, a steep learning curve to be able to effectively use some of these technologies. And if I was to um, you know, expand on this, I don't know if everyone's seen this, um, it's an open source uh, representation of kind of a, a mapping of all of the, the things that are in the cloud native world. Uh, there is a large, there's a vast array of choices and there's a huge learning curve for a, your typical enterprise development shop to learn how to use these things. So um, I've got a subtle plug here for my, my colleague Keith's book. Um, what we set up for as part of the platform for um, hosting and, and operations was uh, consulting kits, patterns and starter kits, sample code sitting in repositories, um, uh, education materials that allowed the delivery teams in the organisation to um, use the power that was going to be given to them when they had direct access to the cloud interfaces. It was um, interesting, 18 months of, uh, of working in a um, uh, large financial services organisation, um, a team that we kicked off at the very start paved the very first path to production that was independent of all those seven teams eight or nine silos in the, in the ops area. And they, they did that, they built, they built out with a very, very small part of their application stack and they were able to deploy that. Um, they were deploying it twice a week, which was unheard of in an organisation that was still only deploying uh, at best once a month and sometimes once a quarter. Um, and 18 months later, I kind of caught up with them again to see, see how they were going. And they were on a, on a weekly basis um, rebuilding their production cluster from scratch, um, which you know, you know, fully patched up to the latest versions, disposing of all their production servers and, and redeploying all their, their their entire application stack without uh, any interruption of service, and ensuring that everything was uh, completely up to date to, for security vulnerabilities and, and anything else that was needed. Um, and that was completely unheard of in that organisation. Patch management was a horrible, horrible mess of changing servers inconsistently across different environments. And so their, their infrastructure as code approach completely changed or created an appetite for people to make use of their, their platform now. So it was a great success. Um, continuous delivery uh, in the large organisation, I said that they, they would only be deploying once every quarter. Um, the, the shift um, that comes with that platform model is we want those platforms, um, we actually made a constraint in two, in two of my clients, uh, a rule that said you can't deploy together. They were used to doing enterprise releases. Everybody goes into, into SIP once. We do lots and lots of end-to-end -end testing across the, the applications and then everybody goes into production on one horrible day once a quarter. And then they move to, some of those applications would go every month, but they would still a bulk of applications would go into a systems integration environment together. And we actually said these, these teams uh, would have a platform. That platform might be eight or ten applications, but two platforms can't deploy together. They can't rely on being deployed together. Um, so that to, to drive that behaviour around um, independence of deployment. Um, and, and that actually is quite scary because you start to have to make... Um, architectural changes to applications, the interfaces and dependencies between them, and that takes time. But, but they've managed to increment towards it, um, which is great. And then you have to walk through the, the change that comes for the change management and release management functions that are, are working in a regulated financial uh, market that are used to having um, careful stage deployments into, into environments and... Um, and uh, uh, a centralised register of documentation and, and approvals, um, we're actually moving more of that responsibility out to the platform teams, which actually then requires education of those teams as to why those controls are in place. What's the purpose of segregation of duties? Um, what is our uh, obligation to the regulators? And, and, and uh, 
we made uh, in the last organisation I worked with a thing called the Enterprise Deployment Framework, which sounds horrible, sounds really big and enterprisey, but um, it's actually just a set of pre-approved patterns and guidance and education on, on what you would need to do in order to have a, a, a path to production that was independent. Um, I'll skip over that. I'll come back to, to, to architecture really briefly. Um, really, yeah. I've said that we, we have these teams that are, that are um, fully cross-functional teams. They have their own architecture and design um, capability, technical, they can deploy and release on demand. Um, so you don't need a centralised architecture team anymore, except that you do um, actually have a few things they need um, in order to help those teams uh, align what they're building to an overall strategy. It's kind of enterprise architecture stuff. But also to help meet the um, uh, govern um, the um, sorry, I'll move on. Uh, compliance requirements. So sometimes you need a, a centralised function to help um, teach teams and, and um, establish um, processes for recording architectural decisions, deployment um, uh, approvals, and make all that information available to the auditors. So that was one, one area that was there. Um, I think um, I talk about these teams that have complete control over their own decision making and technical design and, and, and how they even make use of cloud services and how they deploy. At one um, organisation in Australia, a, 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 a dot com, an online business, um, but at a reasonable scale, they had seven platform teams that all were completely independent. They would meet, the tech leads would meet once a week and discuss what they were, what they were considering to be the best, you know, best outcomes, but ultimately they, they could um, develop whatever they wanted. And so they pushed very much towards the right. High, high degree of, of um, platform autonomy meant that they actually duplicated um, solutions. They would, they would solve the same problem in two or three different, different ways and then share them, show them together and then work out which one was best and then rework everything to kind of go with the latest new version. So you had a high degree of innovation um, and ex experimentation. Um, and organisations tend to, if they allow a little bit of this, they get really scared of duplication. Everybody's doing things differently. It doesn't, you know, it must be very expensive. But actually, actually, a little bit of that has some great benefits. And if you come too far back to the left of consolidating and having central solutions, that they they quickly become a constraint. They become the boat anchors again. So, um, forcing everyone to use one. Um, uh, application server technology because it'd be cheaper. It becomes the, the argument of the day. So it's really, there's something here that the teams and technical leaders can really monitor and they can tweak and sort of push the lever a little bit more towards allowing teams to do their own things. And then when you see that there's a, a common solution, you can actually pull that back and make it a platform offering that other teams can, can build on. So I've seen a lot of that. Um, I'll, I'll wind up. Um, the three things that, that I kind of the, these are the things that I'm passionate about right now. This is the playbook that we're we're talk, I'm talking to customers about. Um, it's kind of ending project and creating um, stable teams that have full responsibility, cradle to grave, for platforms which are a platform for your business to do innovation on top of. So I um, hope that all made sense. There's a couple of things there. One, you can tell, you can sell a lot of this thinking based on the cost of delay. So, like the the um, programs, the big 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 programs that we see um, generally you know, are, are very slow, are very long long to deliver. 
they're not creating an environment in which the digital teams can, can experiment around product and, and engage directly with the customer. And, and organisations like the, insurer, the financial services company I was working with, they are scared, um, very scared, I won't swear, um, to, that they are going to be disrupted by, by someone who has a direct interaction with a customer and can respond really quickly to their need. So you need to create a structure that allows really quick product innovation to where you interact with the customer and then put a veneer over the slower moving <coughs> legacy systems that they've got. So, so there's a big, big business case around that to, to allow for those, uh, that digital innovation. Um, the program and the project versus product uh, funding model is something that, that people need a lot of help to get over. Products and, and my naive, I'm a techno technologist, not, a, not an accountant. But there, a lot of it's driven by the, the convenience of separating out capital expenditure and operational expenditure. You can see that that, that kind of approach has kind of created these divisions all across the place. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't benefit the outcome. So um, there's a lot of uh, work to help people understand how they can do a different style of funding. Is ThoughtWorks basically a management consultant like a McKinsey, or do you also, or differently, create digital products, or what kind of space do you want to find? Um, yes. <laughs> um, traditionally, we are a, um, more around software delivery um, in a new, in a, using modern software engineering techniques. So we do more of a delivery, delivery shop. Um, for many years, we've done we've done consulting um, around as a as a part of our business around uh, everything from um, organisational structures to agile software de uh, de you know, uh, delivery and our lean. So it's a portion of our business is the consulting part. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. I like your answer about saying you know giving the idea to your customer that um, they might be frightened of how other competitors act in their market, even new ones that they don't know about yet. They know that they have been disruptive in other markets, like Amazon, right? Um, so it can happen. And <clears throat> there's this tendency of justifying, um, putting in new ways of doing the work that needs to be done, agile and DevOps from a business perspective, telling them why is it good for the business. Yeah. And then there is this, this other way of doing it, telling them why is this good to survive. Do you have a feeling that um, actually companies or customers change their mind of this? Not asking so much about the business anymore, but asking what can you do with us to help us survive in a market that changes faster and faster and faster and actually uh, have fear of people coming up from somewhere else and doing things better than, than us and we are gone. Is there, is there a change or are they still only looking at what is the, the quarterly uh, doing better? I, I think we have more conversations now around with organisations that are um, recognising that they're too big, they have too much legacy, and they're too slow, and they need a way to to, to survive. Like the actual, like that com that survival, mm -hmm. the conversation comes up more. You'll see a, a there's a slide or a picture. I think it's uh, HBR that shows the the average lifetime of a of a um, of a company. Uh, maybe it's a um, S and P top 500 company, or how long how long they're going to be there before they, you know, and it's, it is dropping. You know, companies live for 50 years, mm -hmm. and now they live for three years, and and so so the, the, everyone's quite aware of how uh, at risk they are, and sometimes the biggest uh, biggest organisations fall the quickest. I like to use the, the um, electric cars thing. You know, being a German, then we have all these companies who set for years. Technology is not there. There's no market for it, nobody wants to buy it, and then suddenly they see, oh, all around us, people start buying electric cars from other people, from other, from other manufacturers. Uh, now, suddenly, 
they change, they don't argue in the market, they don't argue with the technology anymore, they just say that, oh, once we start, we're going to make it better. Uh, but you see them being scared to help. Yep. There's also a real, a real strong theme that organisations um, want to not be a want to be a technology business. Mm -hmm. Not many. I, I, I don't see too many organisations at scale that actually achieve it. But the words are there. The intent is there that they that they need to to not have an IT department as a cost centre. They actually need to be a technology organisation. I think what we talk about is taking part. Like the early parts is taking those customer touch points and putting them in the business. That, um, making teams that look like what we loved as agile teams in the mid two thousands, part of that business unit. Yes. I think you have an interesting concept about the PMO and the sort of the capital costing structure being ineffective. However, what I would observe is, let's say you have a bank, they want to put out some great app, right? silly, higher up or whatever. And once the app is out there, they just basically go into maintenance mode, effectively like changing the color or something trivial. So how does that fit? Maybe I'm saying something with your idea about creating stable teams. It, it, it seems that much of the world is still in a project mode or, or are you looking at the future? Or I think how it's does a, that work? Well, I think it's a, I think not many organizations are, are ready to abandon that kind of, you know, we'll do this project and then switch it into maintenance mode. They're not ready. But if, you, if you've deployed an, app, uh, an application, you're a bank, and you're not increase, you know, working on its features continuously, um, then how can you compete against the disruptors that are going to have you know, the, the new features you know, every, every couple of months? we are working with a, a sorry, I, I know of one bank, I've, I've talked to them, um, which is not, a, is not a traditional bank at all. It's a less than 500 person company now, has a banking license in Australia, completely online company, came from the POS market. They're going to, they're going to create a really compelling experience around dealing with a bank um, that, that the big incumbents can't, can't deal with. And so if they're thinking they deploy an application and then that's okay, they leave that for a three year um, depreciation cycle before they invest in it again, that's not gonna work. But it's not my area, especially to that. No, I agree that when Goldman Sachs just set up their own online bank, essentially as you're describing, because they want a piece of that market. Mm -hmm. cool. cool. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much.